Well, hello, good day once again. Welcome to Whispering Hope Daily Sabbath School Lesson Study. And here I have with me this morning Elder Jacqueline Gordon and Elder Andy David. Say good morning. Happy to have you this morning. I know that you guys always come prepared for me. I can never have a question that can chip you over. So I know you've been studying. And the people are there eagerly waiting this morning. I can see them envision them there waiting for us to get started and to go into the word today. Good morning, Elder Jacqueline. How are you this morning? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, elders. I am well and thanking God for life and happy that we're here again for all of us to study the word of God because indeed the word enlightens all of us and prepare us for heaven at last. Absolutely. Welcome again. Absolutely, absolutely. Elandi, how are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> doing great, doing great. Good morning, good morning. Nice, happy to be here again. Trust that as we continue to discuss this lesson, quite intriguing one, that the Lord will indeed bless us all. Yes, yeah, so a pretty intriguing lesson. I want to believe this is going to be one of the toughest uh, topics we're going to touch in the whole study of the three cosmic messages. This week, the hour of his judgment is come. One of the things I want us to bear in mind as we go through the topic this week, the hour of his judgment is come, is remember that when we're looking at the book of Revelation, only one denomination, and I'm not being biased here this morning, teaches it the way we teach it and understand it the way we understand it at Seventh-day Adventist. So we're going to take our time this week as we go through this topic we're going to make sure, we're not going to probably go into all the intricacies of some of the things that may take you to places that you're not familiar with. But we're going to try to break it down as simple as we possibly can. So by the end of the study, you will truly understand what we are discussing today. Today, we are going to look at the topic, the angel's instruction to Daniel. The angel's instruction to Daniel. But before we do so, we're going to invite Elder Jacqueline Gordon to pray for us this week. And we're going to invite Elder David to bring to us our memory text. Let us bow heads for prayer, Almighty God and our Heavenly Father. We are indeed thankful, O Lord, that you have granted unto us this gift called life. Oh Lord, we are praying even now that as we live from day to day, that your word will be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, I pray especially as we open your word for today's study. Lord, it's not about us because if it was dependent upon us, oh God, we will fail because like Daniel, none of us totally understands. But God, this is where your Holy Spirit comes in. And we are dependent upon the teachings and the promptings of your Holy Spirit to revelate to us, to reveal to us your divine promises for mankind today. So bless your word today as we open it and bless all who are listening to God so they too can be, can be a part of this revelation to be ready for your second coming. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Our memory text for today is taken from Romans chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. Reading from the New King James Version, the Bible says, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Elder Andy, what a powerful text. That's what I am looking at. And saying this text is loaded. We could spend the entire week looking at this passage. Your insight as you looked at our text for this week? Well, Paul is saying here, look, that we need to be aware of the time. Know what time it is. And since you know what time it is, it is time that you awake. Now, I guess the question is, what is the time? What is there to know about the time? How do we know the time? Well, he says, based on the time that we're in, and this is back then. And if he said that back then, then it must be more urgent. Now, based on the time we're in, 
we ought to take note. We ought to pull our socks up because our salvation is nearer. And how do we know the time and what time we're in? Now we are closer to the coming, the second coming of Jesus. And one of the ways in which we can know what time we're in is through prophecy, which is what we're studying. There are markers that are put down, which if we follow closely, we can understand the time that we're in. For example, in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar was given a dream where he saw the image. Most of us know the story. The image whose head was of gold, the chest of silver, belly and tie of brass, legs of iron, feet and toes with iron and clay. If we look at that, if we study that prophecy carefully, that gives us an idea of where we are. We are right now down in the toes. The next part of the vision that is to be fulfilled, as we see if we read Daniel 2, is the one that says there's a stone that will be cut out without hands and smite the image at his feet and break it into pieces. And that stone will now grow and take over the whole world. That stone is representative of Jesus, God's kingdom, his everlasting kingdom, which will be set up. So looking at prophecy, we get an idea of the time that we are in. We are right in the toes of the image. The next thing that is to happen is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Knowing that Paul says, we ought to live our lives in such a way, so close to Jesus, that we can be saved when he comes. Such an important point, Elder Andy. We are supposed to live in a state of preparedness, ready for the second coming. There may be some, there are some skeptics we know who have said, I have heard about Jesus coming that way at the end for so long and Jesus has not yet appeared. But I say to us today, do you know when you're going to die? No one knows. You're not on, you may not be on your sick bed, but no one knows. So because when we die, we go to sleep, the next thing we're going to know is that Jesus will come. We'll either wake in the first resurrection or the second resurrection. So I think Paul, when Paul says that we are to awake out of our sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. We are to run with that, grasp the concept that we are to live in a state of readiness because even if Jesus chooses not to come tomorrow, you and I don't know if we will live to see tomorrow. And because we don't know what the next second or minute of our life holds, it is important that we adhere to the principle laid down by Paul in our memory text. Live as if today is the last. And I want to take the liberty to go into the, the topic for the lesson this week. I just wanted to give some insight. It says the hour of his judgment is come. We have to lay that foundation because some people are looking for this judgment to be called on a big setting, courtroom setting to be in place, and they called up. What is really happening here? And why, uh, when we say the hour of his judgment is come, how do you understand it, or what do you understand it to mean? The Bible tells us that when Jesus comes back the second time, he's coming with his reward to give those who are going to be saved. If he's coming with his reward, it simply means that those who are to be rewarded would have been decided before. It follows, therefore, that the judgment has to take place before. And I think we studied previously that there are different phases of the judgment. The one we are talking here about is the pre-advent judgment. And this week's lesson will help us to understand when that judgment started. Suffice it to say that we are currently in that phase of judgment jesus is now judgment is now taking place so that those who die now their probation would have been closed judgment would have taken place and whether they go to heaven or hell would have been decided so we ought to be careful time does not allow us to go back to see what the day of atonement and the judgment in the old testament meant so that we can apply it now but during the Day of Atonement, the judgment period, 
the people while the priest was in the temple performing the rituals to cleanse the temple and to cleanse the people from their sins, the folks had to be outside. They were supposed to be outside of the temple examining themselves to see where they stand with God. Now we are in that judgment day was symbolic of this judgment happening now. This day of atonement that we're happening now. So just like they were afflicting their souls and examining their lives to see where they stand with God, we during this judgment phase ought to be examining ourselves in the light of God and his word to see where we are so that when our names come up in that judgment, we can be vindicated. Couldn't ask for a better platform to be set for discussion this morning from Elder Andy. We are going to go into our first passage. We're going to invite Elder Gordon to read Daniel chapter 9, verse 23. Daniel chapter 9, verse 23. And then we're going to look at the question, what specific instruction does the angel give to Daniel? What specific instruction does the angel give to Daniel? Daniel chapter 9, verse 23, reading from the King James Version. At the beginning of thy supplications to the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, in response to the question, what matter? As we look in the book of Daniel chapter 9, there is no vision outlined in the book of Daniel chapter 9. No, so it means that the vision that Daniel got in chapter 8, it seems as if Gabriel, because just a synopsis of the, um, a prelude of what transpired then, we know in Daniel chapter 8, Eight, when Daniel saw the ram and the he goat, some refer to it as the rough goat, and they had their um, conflict taking place there. He did not understand, and it, but what he, the interpretation came through the angel Gabriel to help him to understand. But something happened there also as Daniel was seeing in the vision, the goat and the ram and the conflict taking place there. There was a little harm power and it is stated there in Daniel chapter eight. If you look from verse nine, it says, and it works great, even to the host of the heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and stamp upon it. 11, he, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host and by him the daily sacrifice. When we get down now to verse 13, he says, then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint, we speak, how long? shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under the foot. In other words, how long will truth be trampled on? How long will error succeed? The answer came and he said unto him in verse 14, and he said, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Gabriel was giving Daniel the interpretation that the ram and the goat represented Media and Persia and so on. But when he came to explain the prophecy of the 2,300 days, the Bible said that Daniel fainted. And so we find us stop there. When we go over to Daniel 9, as the question is being asked, and Gabriel is saying, no, he come. He came to Daniel for Daniel to understand the matter. The question is, what matter? We must go back then from the 2300 days prophecy to explain that to Daniel because he could not have continued because why? Daniel fainted. So to answer the question, Elder, he was to understand the matter. 
And to understand the matter, we have to go back to Daniel chapter 8 for the conclusion and interpretation of the 2300 days prophecy. We're going to take part of the question, but when she said Daniel fainted, you know, Daniel looking down and seeing what we have seen, what our four parents have seen. You know, he would have seen the, the birth of Jesus, Herod trying to kill him, the crucifixion of Jesus, the killing of the martyrs back there in the early church, and then the dark ages, and all these things coming down the century, and how Satan was warring with the church. That's a lot of gruesome detail to look at. I, I'm sure some ladies, I know men to what, they faint at the very smallest sight of blood. Some people can't stand blood. They just faint away the minute they see blood. David, Daniel fainted. But my question, as we study this topic, um, Elder David, and we look at Daniel 8.14, why is this significant in understanding the meaning of the cleansing of the sanctuary that we need to go back to Daniel 8.14? Elder God articulated a while ago what happened in the vision in Daniel 8 and so on and how Daniel fainted when he heard about the 2300 days, which we shall find out is 2300 years. We need to understand that when Daniel fainted and the angel came back, that angel came back, I think it was some 13 years elapsed between when Daniel fainted and when the Gabriel, Gabriel came back. So I think that the angel had to help Daniel to make the link for him to understand that, look, the vision you saw back then years ago, when the part of the vision you did not understand, I have, I have come now, I have come now to help you to understand that same vision. All right? So what I'm telling you now is the interpretation. What I'm telling you now will help you to understand the 2300 days or the 2300 years. So that it was important to make the link. It was important for him to understand that it's the same prophecy. And that becomes important for us today so that we can understand, look, it is the same vision. It's just a continuation. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the things about the book of Daniel, we saw the same vision happening in chapter 2. Um, but being represented again in chapter 7 with different beasts about the kingdom, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Babylon. And they were all in different symbolism. Some bringing out more clearly the swiftness of how one power would pass on, depicted in the image of the beast. Those. So Daniel really saw the history of the world unfolding before him. And so that must have been a terrible picture. But we're going to move on into our lesson this morning because time is creeping up on us quickly. And we're going to go to Gabriel. Daniel chapter 9, Elder God, you'll read for us this morning again. It says, God continues in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. What events in the life and ministry of Jesus is this about? Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. And it reads, King James Version. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troubled times. So he be began by explaining to Daniel, that's the angel Gabriel, that 70 weeks is to be taken away from the 200, from the 2300 days prophecy. And then we know 
that in, in Ezekiel chapter 4, another Bible text, speaks to prophetic time. It is such a long prophetic time period that we know the principle of one day equals a year is applied here. Because if you don't take it in a prophetic time, then it will be much, 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 much shorter. And as you rightly say, Elder, Daniel saw this entire prophecy. So many things were happening, especially the crucifixion of Jesus and all these things. And so we know it expands along years of time. So the first 70 years, the first 70 weeks, during that 70 weeks, and remember we are applying the one day, one year principle. Se seven days make a week. And so we have seven times seven. We come all the way down to 490 years or 490 days applying the day, year principle. During that time frame, we see first it began with Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, declaring and giving the Jews the legal authority to go back to Jerusalem to restore the temple. Remember, Gabriel said to him, upon the proclamation of the decree to restore the temple, so it began there, and we know that that happened sometime in 457 BC, right down to the Messiah and the prophecy even give a timeline when Jesus himself would be baptized, AD 27. So he talked about the baptism and in Jesus, it refers to here the anointed one or the holy one. So we see all these things happening, the baptism of Jesus happening, the crucifixion of Jesus happening, and the message going out to the Gentiles. Because remember the first 70 weeks or 490 years belong to the, the Jews for them to, for all these prophecies to be fulfilled. And then we have the message going out to the Gentiles and we know the stoning of Stephen's and Saul carrying the, being the ambassador really to carry the message to the Gentiles. So I think all that prophetic timeline ties in there with the 70 weeks prophecy. I think she captured it nicely there, yeah. The prophecy is 2,300 years, but the 2,300 years encompassed some other things. The entire ministry of Jesus and so on. Just to say that if you look at the, 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 the prophecy, the 490 years period between there, we had um, the baptism, like she might rightly mentioned, of Jesus Christ, the uh, crucifixion of Jesus Christ. When you look at the prophecy and the history, they were fulfilled with pinpoint accuracy. And that is why I love prophecy. It helps us to know and understand that the word of God is indeed true. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're going to move on here and we're going to look at the question. How do you know or how can you justify a day for a year principle? You know, as seven Adventists, all the time we speak about this day day for a year principle. But people who are not studying the Bible deeply just figure that we come up or conjure up some story or some justification for the 1844 culmination of the 2300 day prophecy and the beginning of the investigative judgment. And so, Evans, you need to help me here and you need to help our audience this morning. How do we come up with this? Day for a year principle. Well, I can start with Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6. We see here that, I don't know, human beings, we tend to just turn our backs upon God over and over and over again, in spite of the fact that we know the consequence of sin leads to death. So here we have the children of God, the Israelites, they were sinning time and time again. And so Ezekiel was called by God in Ezekiel chapter 4, and this was symbolic. It was symbolic where Ezekiel, he had, God instructed him in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 4, to lie down upon thy left side 
and laid the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, and thou shalt bear the iniquity. And what we've seen happen again, he was asked to lie 390 days, but God himself says, and when thou shalt accomplish them, lie on thy right side, thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Jehovah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. And that is in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6. God himself says that I have appointed thee each day for a year. So in this context, this is not prophetic. This is not prophecy. It was symbolic because of the sins God asked his prophet to lie down on one, his left side 390 days, lie on the right side, and one represented Israel, one for Judah, and he himself said that the principle of the one day a year principle would apply. Because of course, you don't expect to use the prophetic time now because that would expect, expand so long beyond the lifetime of Ezekiel himself. So God himself specified in this chapter and in this verse that the one day, one year principle is applied in this context. Okay, added to what Ella Gordon said, yes, we've seen Ezekiel where the Bible says that there are some times when the one the day year principle is applied, meaning you use one, one day represents a year. Now, what we need to understand in this prophecy, we're dealing with symbolism. The prophecy is full of symbolism. We spoke about, Elder Gordon mentioned earlier, the he goat and the ram and so on. Those were symbolic of nations, Greece and, and Medo Persia and so on. Likewise, the day here, the 2300 days, are symbolic, meaning 2300 years. The other thing is, when you apply the day year principle to this prophecy in Daniel, you see that everything comes out perfect, pinpoint accuracy. And that is one way to do it. Put it to the test. Put the day year principle to a test. When put to a test in Daniel's prophecy, it comes out accurately with pinpoint accuracy. So, should you use the 2300 days literally, then that goes nowhere. It, it bears nothing out. So, yes, we know for sure. Uh, on top of what Ella Gordon said, and the fact that we're dealing with symbolism and prophecy, and when we put it in the test in Daniel's prophecy, we see it comes out perfectly, the timelines in, in Daniel's prophecy. And Elder David, this is exactly what happened to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel, if you go back to Daniel chapter 9, Daniel was reading the book of Jeremiah, the scrolls, and he knew that it was prophesied then that 70, he was looking literally under 70 weeks that would be accomplished during that time. So he knew, he said, no, the time of Israel bondage is coming to an end based on what he read that was told to Jeremiah. However, that is why he went down in prayer. And that is symbolic for us today. When we don't understand, we are to approach the throne room of God because he went down in prayer, went down in sackcloth, and the angel gave at the end of his prayer, when he confessed the sin of Israel for God to give an answer, the angel Gabriel came again to pick up from where he left off on the 2300 days prophecy. Absolutely, absolutely. So we move on to our final question and while you're doing your final answer, you could just give to me your takeaway as well. The question asks, what was the 490 years that Gabriel told Daniel about cut off from? We touched that somewhere earlier in the discussion this morning and Sister Elder Gordon so nicely put it together, but now we're seeing not only is it included in the 2300 day prophecy, but it has been, it was cut off. What was it cut off from? It was cut off from the 2300 days or 2300 years prophetic time. So it becomes a part, it's really a part of the 2300 days prophecy, but that special time, 70 weeks, or 490 days year principle was for the Jews, was for Christ to the accomplishment of the sanctuary. Because you must understand, the sanctuary was built, God gave instruction for it, 
and the plan of salvation was executed. It was symbolic of what Christ would have done. It pinpointed the baptism of Jesus and it happened exactly on time. So, you know, I was reflecting and I was saying, maybe King Artaxerxes, when he gave the decree for them to go back, maybe he thought it was his doing, but it was already it was already prophesied that this would happen. So everything happened on time. It was of the 70 year period was about Jesus, Jesus' ministry. And remember at his baptism, that is when he was fully anointed. Remember the Holy Ghost came down upon him. And God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then he came right down to his crucifixion when he in, go back to the temple the veil was rent from top to bottom it means that the plan of salvation was fulfilled in jesus because the lamb of god shed his blood gave his life for sinners so the whole sanctuary service is something that is symbolic to christ so when christ would have died accomplish that work the lamb of god what the blood was shed it means now that we don't need those symbolism the census and and no priests confessing your sins to the priest and all these things those are not needed because if we follow the sanctuary god set it up in a way where you don't confess your sins to man but rather symbolically laying the hands on the, the lamb and we know the whole process with that so it pinpoints and it was accurate, just as Daniel got it in the prophecy. So what's your takeaway now, Elder Gardner? You're slipping away from My takeaway, Elder, let me tell you, in studying, I always hear Elder David, and, and you know, I um, prophecy really is what really helps us to know the authenticity of the Bible. When you know everything pinpoint on time, regardless of the tumultuous effect of the Satan. It must happen. We know what happened with Jesus. He didn't want him to go to the cross. He worked in Peter to cut off the ear of the soldier. He worked in Judas. He worked in all of them. But it had to be accomplished. So, yes, it happened. He rose from the dead. He is in heaven interceding for us. And thank God, even during this prophecy, the 2,300 days, salvation came to the Gentiles. I am a part of that plan. I am a part of God's plan of salvation. And I know all of us, we are a part. Let us hold faithful because if pro prophecy dictates that it happened already and everything happened on time, Jesus will come and he will come on time. I think Elder Gordon dealt with that appropriately. Indeed, it was cut off. The 490 was cut off or it was a part of the 2300 days but it's just that there are certain things that were supposed to happen along the way within that 490 years period so yes the 490 years period is a part of the 2300 days but the bible just wanted us to know that there were certain things which the elder garden nicely articulated that would have happened within that time what is my takeaway today the admonishes us to know the times in which we live it is very important that we understand the times in which we live. And it says, since we understand the time, we ought to ensure that we live close to Jesus. You know, last week's lesson said that, spoke about the good news of the judgment. Sometimes when people hear about the judgment, they become terrified. But we do not have to be terrified. Because hand in hand with the judgment goes the, the gospel, the, the everlasting gospel, which says that Jesus died for us. When once we accept him, live for him, then the gospel can be good news for us. Let us understand the times. Stay close to Jesus. The judgment can be good news for all of us. Amen. Amen. We want to thank Elder Gordon and Elder David for bringing so clearly to us our lesson for today. A very important lesson. We were trying to dig, dig deep into what was the angel's instruction to Daniel. And so this morning, as I say to you, judgment is upon us. Every day, records are being examined. When your name comes up, how will it fare with you and your God? My word to you this morning is to place your hands in the hands of Jesus Christ. He's the one who was found worthy to stand and to open the seal 
of that book because he's the one who died for us. He's the one who is going to represent us. And he's the same one, if we are found faithful, will vindicate us. May God bless you as you go through today. Remember to share, to subscribe, and to like. God bless you and have a wonderful day.